Today is Passion Sunday, which is the fifth Sunday in Lent. Let us pray. As Christ's passion approaches, let us walk the way of the cross and put our trust in God. Let us put our hope in God. Let us wait for the Lord with the eagerness of those who watch for the morning. Let us live as those who believe that the Lord's love never fails. Let us share your hope with those in despair. Our first hymn is number 107 in the Singing the Faith. I sing the almighty power of God that made the mountains rise. Let us pray. Christ of the cross, through your passion, God has touched our broken world afresh, grace and healing, forgiving our waywardness, lighting all our darkness and bringing hope of reconciliation and new beginnings. Help us to use these final weeks of Lent, not in a tedious way, going without, trying harder, but as a time for stripping away the pride of busyness and self-importance. Help us to make it a time of risk, the risk of being still, the risk of waiting, the risk of listening, the risk of being vulnerable and open to your touch, that we may embrace new truths and see the bones of old ways clothed with the flesh of self-giving and love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And our prayer of confession. Lord, we have nearly reached Jerusalem, but the best and worst is yet to come. You know that we will lose courage and faith and will leave you alone to walk the terrible road to Calvary while we watch from the safety of the crowd. Lord, forgive us as you forgave your first followers and wait for us in Galilee that we may share your resurrection joy and go on to fulfill our vocation as Peter and the disciples fulfilled theirs. Amen. Amen. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, Our Father who art in, in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, come thy will, thy will be, done, be done, on earth as, as it is in heaven. Give us, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against, against us. us. And, and lead us, us not into temptation, but deliver, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the power and the glory, for forever and, and ever. Amen. Amen. We're now going to have our Old Testament reading, which is from the book of Ezekiel. The reading is from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all round them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and will act, says the Lord. Thank you, David. Our next hymn is number 348. And now it's time for our Gospel reading. Our Gospel reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 to 45. Now a certain man was ill, 
Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus. Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said again to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. And are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. 
Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. How much do we believe in resurrection? Without the death of Christ on the cross, there would be no resurrection. And without the resurrection, where would be our relationship with the Holy Spirit, who helps unfold the mysteries of truth and love? But before you can have a resurrection, there has to be death. And in many, many people today, death is a taboo subject, especially in the West. We know that when, with the advances of technology and medicine, we can often resuscitate people whose heart has stopped beating and are no longer breathing. We have wonderful doctors, nurses and paramedics who try to give us longer living and help us cope with incurable illnesses. The idea of people, though, being brought back to life is not new. In the past, there have been different cultures who have dreamt and longed for this possibility to be true. We know from the Terracotta Army that the Chinese at one time also had ideas of resurrection. Our two Bible readings hold quite a challenge for us. At the time of Ezekiel, the Israelites were in captivity in Babylon. They were in despair. Would they ever return to their homeland? They felt shut off and deserted by God. Ezekiel had been a prophet predicting the doom and gloom in which they now found themselves. But now here he was bringing them hope and comfort. God had not forsaken them and he would paint a picture to show them of his love and concern. Here was a dry desert valley where lay the remains of many Israelite warriors, which may depict those who lost their lives trying to defend their country from the Babylonians. Ezekiel has been taken to this area of bleached dry bones and was asked by God to tell them to become joined up again with muscles, sinew and skin to cover them. And finally, that God would breathe into them to bring them alive a resurrection of many warriors. So from this state of despondency and depression, God came to reassure them through Ezekiel. This idea of new life and resurrection was a reassurance to the Israelites that God had not forsaken them and that eventually their former land would be restored to them. Our story of Lazarus Lazarus, to some extent, is a complicated one. Both Martha and Mary greet Jesus with the same words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. One thing we cannot pick up from the written word is the manner in which these words were spoken. Martha has hope in the resurrection for Lazarus, and she states this to Jesus. Jesus uses their dialogue to make clear that he himself is the resurrection of the life. The exchange with Mary is not as clear, and we are left to fill in the gaps. What was Mary's mood when she spoke these words to Jesus? Were Mary's words spoken in rage or disgust? Did Mary speak these words out of deep disappointment and a loss of faith in someone she had believed in and followed? And were Mary's tears simply an expression of her grief or of disappointment that Jesus hadn't arrived in time to heal her brother? However, there is more to this story of love as the next few sentences tell us. Jesus begins to weep. Moved by the love and grief the townspeople have for Lazarus and by his own emotion. Jesus requests that the tomb be opened he then offers a prayer of thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving, which is normally received after the event. This was because Jesus knew the loving power of God. Having also prayed that those watching might have understanding and belief, Jesus cries out, Lazarus, come out! And the man, once dead, leaves his tomb, loved to life, 
the love of God in Jesus restores Lazarus to new life. Some may look at these stories and become overcome by despair at the destruction described there and overcome by wondering if they are looking deep enough for in order for there to be grief and pain, there must have been love. As we approach Holy Week, Golf Gotha can look as much a place of despair as the Valley of the Dry Bones or Lazarus's tomb. But if our adventure in faith has taught us anything, it should be that having loved us in life to begin with, God in Christ promises us nothing but love to the end and beyond. It's Christ's one commandment to us. Love one another, for lo such love is eternal life. Jesus had denied coming to Bethany, even though he knew that Lazarus was dead. The emphasis in this passage is on the power of God to restore Lazarus to life, to, to restore Jesus to life after his resurrection, after his crucifixion, rather than the beginning back to life of Lazarus. Jesus also seems to be teaching the disciples about his death and resurrection and trying to bring them into a place or a deep, of deeper understanding and, a, and greater understanding as well of about what was going to happen when they reached Jerusalem and after they had celebrated the Passover. The restoring of life to Lazarus was in effect a glorifying of God himself. These two readings that tell us about resurrection, we can look at our own world today. How well do Christians empathise with the despairing, or do Westerners empathise with the truly destitute and dispossessed of this world? Do we appreciate the importance of the lack of any prospect of immediate improvement? Can we imagine what it must be like to live in a refugee camp, especially at the moment, or amid the major devastation after a natural disaster in a poor country? How do we feel with people in parts of our country whose homes have been flooded because of the continuing rain and the slow receding of floodwaters, the long drying out process that must seem to last forever? Does the gap between our own experiences and those of others not so fortunate limit the bringing of good news to these people? How can we play the Ezekiel to the despairing? Perhaps this coronavirus pandemic helps us to understand a little better what others have to suffer in difficult circumstances. It's only just about a week since we were asked to stay indoors, or most of us, and we know how difficult that is. How good are we at refraining from a judgment when people seem negative and inclined to grieve unnecessarily long or deeply? Does grief and even despair have a positive function to perform in keeping individuals and communities sane? Are we too buttoned up and repressed in modern society? The word prophecy in Hebrew can also be translated as rave. What's some more raving about the state of the world and its violence and the lack of justice be a good thing? Should we be doing and saying or shouting more about injustice? These are some of the questions that these passages suggest to us. How do we relate to the joy of resurrection to those in despair? We are strongly reminded that from the utter uselessness of bare bleached bones, God can lift us up into life. That from the apparent hopelessness of death, and the despair of losing someone we love, can God restore us to life? And I'm sure this is a very strong message to us at this time. Amen. Amen. And our prayers of intercession. We pray for those living with the bare bones of resources, for the homeless, and we pray for the food banks as they struggle at this time and help to alleviate some of the distress. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for those who feel let down by others, whose authorities are expected to meet unspecified requirements where people are suffering, suffering in redundancy, unemployment, having lost their jobs because of Brexit and coronavirus, or waiting for life-saving surgery, which has been put on hold. We pray for the people who have lost relatives and loved ones, especially to this coronavirus attack, and are greatly distressed. Help them to find closure as they grieve and come to terms with their loss. Help us to come alongside these people and try to show our concern and care. Remember that it's for the whole world now that we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, prayer. our prayer. We pray for those tempted to despair because they cannot find the right way to go, because they have lost those they love or have become unemployed and are finding it difficult to get employment because their country is suffering from the coronavirus. There is limited resources available. And for those whose countries stir at war and they are terrified, for those who live in refugee camps because they have lost their homes, lost their loved ones, lost their families, yes, lost everything and have nothing left. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, prayer. our prayer. We ask for your healing powers to be fully extended to all of those affected by this sickness. And in a few moments of silence, let us pray for the members of our congregations, our family and friends who are sick at this time. Lord Jesus, draw close to them and to us all, bringing all to a place of hope and life in all its fullness. We offer these prayers in your name. Amen. Amen. And our last hymn is number 276. Lift high the cross, the love of Christ proclaim, till all the world adore his sacred name.
and a blessing for everybody. Wherever we go, may the joy of God the gracious be with us. Wherever we go, may the face of Christ the kindly be with us. Wherever we go, may the encompassing spirit of grace and truth be with us. Wherever we go, may the presence of the Trinity surround us to bless and keep us. Amen. Amen.